What I want to do today, if we get the slides up, is basically talking to you a little bit about cloud in the enterprise. Now, we've talked a lot about SMB, and somebody said, well, SMB may mean different things in different countries. Enterprise also means different things in different countries. I consider an enterprise basically an entity that has somewhere in one way, form, or shape an IT department. And you will understand in, during my presentation why I basically say that. So is this a 500 people company? Is this a 10,000 people company, a 300,000 people company? I don't know, you make your mind up there. But and I want to talk about, I think, something which is very, very important which is the fact that we're moving in the IT industry from an infrastructure thinking to a services thinking. And I want to explain you first how we got there, and then I'll explain you what I mean, and I want to finish with a bunch of examples because I think examples often present and speak better than uh, giving a lot of theory. Examples of people that have actually taken that to a certain level. So let me start by why are we in this situation where, fine, where, where, where really information technology is becoming pervasive, core and center to everything that we do. It's interesting to see if you go back to the 80s, all the way from the 80s to now, that basically the way we have information, the way we do things, what's under the hood of our cars, what's all over the place, has drastically changed. And there's a number of different things around that. Who amongst you doesn't have a smartphone or iPad or tablet today? Let me tell you a story. Um, there was a professor, a French professor, that wanted a, to analyze people that had no mobile phones to really understand why that was the case. He ended up talking to one of my lady's friends because he couldn't find enough people. He needed 500 people to do his analysis. He couldn't find 500 people in the whole of France that didn't have a mobile phone. Okay, so he ended up talking to my friend who, does, who doesn't know anything about technology and doesn't have a mobile phone, so he, she was one of them. Um, but that sort of shows you how pervasive that has come. Second thing is, all of our information has become digital. Our photographs are digital, our music is digital, our video is digital, our films are digital, even our books are digital today. Everything has become digital. Do you know how much, which is the part of a car that is electronics and IT? Today, depending a little bit on the brand, it's anywhere between 30 and 40% of the value of the car is electronics. I used to be responsible for the electronics industry at HP and I had a colleague who was responsible for the car industry. And I used to tell him, pretty soon you'll report to me because car will be nothing else than electronics. We're down that path. Finance, 97% of the world wealth is numbers on computers. Doesn't have any physical substance. Think about that, okay? In the old days, when we had something to say to somebody, we went to the pub or to the bar or to the cafe, depending on which country you are, and we had a chat. Now we still have a chat, but it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, maybe if we're a bit more serious, it's on LinkedIn. It's digital. And last but not least, and that was really, that was two weeks ago, that was really the coup that made it for me. I saw an article in one of the Belgian newspapers, I'm, I'm actually living in Brussels, in one of the Belgian newspapers, saying that the EU had analyzed a number of mobile applications and their effect on health and they had named Angry Bird as a very good application to reduce stress, believe me or not. So we're even going to use digital aspects to think about our health. So everything is becoming digital. Everything is becoming bits and bytes on computers in one way or form or shape. And what are we looking for? We just want to have access to that. Where that is, how it gets to us, 
Most of us as end users, we don't care about it. We just want to have access to it. And by the way, I wanted to show you when we want it on our fingertips. That's why I took this very old fashioned stuff that is called a keyboard. Because frankly, today, most people don't use keyboards anymore, except virtual ones. Um, but that's really what we're talking about. Now, if I bring that to the industry and to the enterprise, a lot of people are asking themselves, hey, why can I not do in the enterprise what I can do at home? I share my family pictures on Dropbox. Why can't I share the list of my key clients on Dropbox with my other people? Oops. Okay, a lot of us, I see already some faces. Okay, but that's really what end users are actually doing. Now, the good news is cloud is being adopted by enterprises. That's the good news. Now, what this um, analysis doesn't say is, is this with or without the blessing of IT? It happens, okay? 54% of people are using cloud for doing test and death. 45 to doing disaster recovery. What is it, 41 to do email, and so on, and so on, and so on. But is it with or without? the sanctions of IT. The interesting piece is why they do it. And the number two elements have to do with responsiveness, agility, flexibility, call it the terms, being able to respond faster. Our industries, our world is a very interesting one. About six months ago, I was talking to the CIO of one of the largest telcos in Belgium. And I asked him a very simple question. I said, you know who the number one telco in the world is in the world by number of phone calls made? And he couldn't answer. He said, well, I don't know, AT&T or China Telecom. I said, no, 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 no. It's a company called Skype. And he said, oh, yeah, but Skype is not competition. Oh, no, 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 no. Skype doesn't even make money at this. And my answer was very simple. I said, look, you may think that, but between you and me, every time I call my daughter up, who lives in Switzerland, my daughter up on Skype, you don't get money. Okay? So in my mind, I call that a competitor. So being able to respond to that competition, that may come from Nowhere. I mean, Sky bloody hell, it's two guys, I think it was in Sweden, they originally started with something called Casa, which was sharing files, and then they moved into Skype, okay? And then it moved to eBay, and then it was gone out again, and all of those good things. Who would ever have seen that happening? But that's where they are today. So it's really interesting to see that people are starting to think about cloud as a way to help them be more responsive. And it's interesting that if you look at the same study, the buyers really point that out. We, as sellers of tools and software and services in cloud, we still have it wrong. And I heard a couple of people saying it here earlier today, saying, oh, well, we go for cloud because it's cost reduction. That's actually only the fifth reason for buyers to go to cloud. It's very, very interesting to see. It all started about, oh yes, but Amazon is cheaper than doing it in-house. We've passed that. That in my mind demonstrates that that market is actually very quickly maturing. And why are people moving to that market? Number one is people are globalizing. The world is really becoming a global place. If you're a network equipment provider, 10 years ago, you would probably not even have thought about having Huawei being one of your competitors. Today, they're the number one. Very interesting, okay? The demographics are changing. We, and I can put myself in that, the baby boomers are slowly but surely going to retire, and we're replaced by a different generation. You know that generation that walks like this? You know? <laughs> Look at your children if you have some. That's the new people that are coming in the business. They're very computer literate. 
They have that on their fingertips. They've learned and they've lived and they've breathed with the internet. They were born about the same time as the internet. And so you get these guys on IT that are telling them that they can't do something? Give me a break. If IT doesn't give it to me, I'll get it somewhere else. You know, we did an analysis a couple of years ago on whether we used what we call shadow IT. You know how we ended up finding out? We went to the employee expense management system and we looked at, we're using Amex, we looked at Amex card slips that were labeled Amazon Cloud Services, Amazon Web Services. And we found at least 50, so we knew somebody was doing something with it. But what, but what were they doing with it? Nobody knew. Now why does it take IT so long to get to the internet? Some of them are going to infrastructure as a service. That far is not too difficult. And really, if you think about it, infrastructure as a service, I move from requesting a physical server to requesting a virtual server is pretty much of the same thing. No much change. But boy, start asking platform as a service or software as a service is a whole different ballgame. When I go and talk to CIOs and their teams, I often get this situation. I don't know how it is with you, but I often get this situation. I'm handing up the small window servers. I'm handing up the large window servers. I'm handing up the Unix servers. I'm handing up NAS storage. I'm handing up SAN storage. We have a bunch of silos. And like one customer was telling me the other day, he said it takes me 60 days to take a server in production. Why? Because first of all, the server guys need to go and get the server into the data center. So they need to call upon the, 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 guy, the facilities guys to actually put the server in the rack. Now when the server is in the rack, they need to go to the asset guys to make sure that the server is recognized in the asset. And then they need to go to the storage guys to make sure that they attach some storage to that server. And then they need to go to the networking guys and oh boy, those networking guys are busy to get an IP address. That takes three weeks. And so on and so on and so on. Cloud brings you a complete different approach. You're talking about governance of services. What do I need to deliver of services? You talk about sourcing of external services. You talk about a cloud platform, if you have a private cloud, that you need to keep up and running. All the bells and whistles, not just the servers, not just the storage, but the whole thing. That's probably one of our major inhibitors for many of our IT departments realizing that they need to transform themselves. But they're in a bit of a difficult situation because on the one end, they need to transform themselves for that whole service stuff. But on the other hand, hey, traditional IT is not gonna go away anytime soon. You know, there's so much investment in traditional IT that's gonna stay there for quite a while. I remember I joined HP 33 years ago at the beginning of the period of the minis and I was told that the mainframe was dead. Now we're 30 years later, the mainframe is well and kicking, thank you. Same is going to happen to traditional IT. If you've invested $100 million in SAP, you're not gonna throw that away tomorrow to put that in the cloud. You first gonna make sure that you make your money out of that. And maybe in five, 10 years time, you may start thinking. So IT needs to sit on top of that, of those two different worlds, continuing maintaining that traditional world, and at the same time, transforming themselves to really get into that cloud world. And on top of that, they spend the bulk of their money in, may, in keeping the plane flying, rather than in transforming that plane. And at the same time, there is this pressure from the business saying, hey guys, I need this, you're too slow, you need to be agile, you need to be responsive, and so on and so on and so on. Not realizing the issues that we've been talking about here over the last two days about data, about privacy, about regulations, about all of those elements. So we're at an interesting turning point where we really need to start working in a world that becomes more complex. Where on the one hand, you have 
consumers, consumers of services. On the other hand, you have providers, providers of services. The question that enterprise IT need to ask themselves is, what role do I want to play? Do I want to be one of the service providers? Or do I want to be what I call the strategic service broker, which is the entity that for the enterprise will understand the services that are actually required by the enterprise, that the enterprise needs, and goes and gets those services from where, from the right place. So stops trying to build everything on their own, but move to a way where they build what makes sense and they source everything else. Okay. So you become that intermediary, that service broker that we've actually talked about. Now, the world we're coming from is a traditional IT world, where we have dedicated systems associated with dedicated applications. Now, most of us that have sort of made a move to the cloud are somewhere, somehow, in sort of a patchwork. We still have that traditional environment. We may have some private cloud capabilities because we may have tried some things. We may, either with or without the knowledge of IT, have public clouds. We may have some more secure public -like type clouds, which we call managed clouds, where you have proper contracts and you know where the data is and all sorts of things like that. But you're asking the end user to really know where to find what service. That's not what the end user wants. That's not what the end user is interested in. The end user would love to go to one place, one portal, where they can find all the services they need and choose which service they want to use at any given moment in time, potentially with approval cycles and all the good things that go with it, like we've always done, and then that service is provided from them, to them, either from the traditional environment or from the private cloud or from a managed cloud or from a public cloud environment. Doesn't matter. That has two advantages. First of all, it shields the complexity away from the user, which makes it easier to the user to actually use the services that are provided by IT, rather than go out behind the back of IT and finding some others, because you're not going to be able to stop him if he doesn't find what he needs in IT. But secondly, that gives IT the capability behind the scenes to start migrating things as and when that makes sense changing public cloud provider, if that makes sense at the moment in time, eventually taking some of the functionality of the traditional environment, move it to a private, a managed or public cloud, and so on. That's really that concept of hybrid delivery. We have a tendency to call that converged cloud, where everything ends up converging to the desktop of the user to that one single place. So keep that in mind, and let's start looking at what we can do beyond the technology. Because I think there is also something interesting happening, which is that while we're migrating and moving to the cloud, you know, we've always talked about IT, but frankly, when you talk and when you deal with IT, you should say we've always talked about IT, with a big T on technology. That is slowly but surely changing. Information is actually becoming more and more important. It's becoming more and more important to the business. So the integration of infrastructure, which is the T, information and application really gives the users what they actually need. The only problem is 90% of that information is unstructured. And if you really look at it, 90% of that information sits somewhere out there. I use the term cloud. It sits on the internet. It doesn't sit in my data centers. But it's that information that will give me that additional knowledge I need to build, to, to kill my competition. And remember, you know, it's enough to be faster and more agile than your competitor. You know, I always use the same paraphrase. There's two guys walking in the savanna. 
and out far one of them sees a tiger. He says, oh my god, a tiger has seen us. And the other one kneels down and he puts his running shoes on. And the first one tells him, he says, hey, and you think that with your running shoes you're going to outrun the tiger? And the other one turns to him and he says, I don't need to outrun the tiger, I just need to outrun you. The same applies to business. If you are able to respond faster than your competitor, even in a negative environment, you can still win. So how can I, using technology on the one end with cloud, and information, and knowledge, and understanding of the market, can I actually act faster than my competitor? That's ultimately what you're really thinking about. So it's all about understanding that information that's out there. And where is that information? It's in tweets, it's in forums, it's in chats, it's in, uh, uh, in blogs, it's all over, in newspapers, in articles, in videos, in, in audio signals, it's in all sorts of different things. Welcome to the world of big data. I believe strongly that cloud and big data in one way, form or shape, and you know, we, we in IT, we're very good to change names about every five years. So cloud started in 2007, so pretty soon we're gonna have to find a new name. Okay, I don't know what the name is going to be, so I can't give you the scoop, but we sort of, at the end of the term cloud, we're going to have to find something else pretty soon. Not that the principles are going to change in any way, form, or shape. They haven't changed. It's been always an evolution, but we always end up coming up with new names. But it's really around finding the insights to understand what is actually happening and to act accordingly. That now gives me the capability to innovate. Because a lot of people, when you talk to them about cloud, either they come on and they say, oh, a virtual machine, let me give me a server. Or they say about, I'm going to transition my existing applications to the cloud. I believe cloud has a very, has an other function, which is related to innovation. Where and how can I innovate? I can innovate in my business models. I can do new things, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. I can innovate in my product service continuum, start doing things differently. I can innovate in my ecosystem, for example, getting my uh, better collaboration across my supply chain. I can innovate in IT. All of that is supported by innovation in technologies and cloud, mobility, big data are all elements that are actually playing there. So, I've talked a lot, let me now come to a couple examples. And I'm going to start, if you don't mind, with a very personal example. Back in 2002, we had the great, well I'm not sure I can say great, privilege of being the third large, of being the company that had the third largest reserves in warranty in the world, after General Motors and Ford. Why? Because we were selling 25, 000, 25 million PCs and, 25 mil and about 30 million printers. And they occasionally something went wrong, so we had to take provisions. We couldn't cope with that. We felt that was way too much. But we didn't know how to figure out when we had something wrong. So we started, we found out a technology to really analyze unstructured information and started applying that to the engineering repair logs, to the emails we got from our customers, to what was said in forums, to all of those tools. Okay. We've been doing that now for about 10 years. We've moved from number three to number seven, while we've increased the amount of our sales to 50 million PCs and 60 million printers. So we've doubled our market and we've reduced the amount of warranties we needed drastically because we have the insight, the understanding. That's one example. The other example, have you ever seen that car? It's a concept car that was created by Fiat Brazil. It's called the Fiat Mio. This is an exercise that was done about two years ago. What did they do? They combined two things. Something that is called crowdsourcing. 
a platform in which you, me, and anybody could give feedback. And then an internal site where they collaborated amongst designers, suppliers, and all the thing. And they went out and they wanted to create a car specifically for Brazil. Or at least a concept of a car specifically for Brazil. They thought it was going to be a large, you know, the Brazilians, a large, fancy car. They got more than 18,000 people working with them day to day on giving them hints, thinking, and they came out over a 12-month period with that car. Huge success. Huge disappointment to the people because they, never, they did not manufacture the car. Had they done, they would have had 18,000 customers immediately because that way the 18,000 people actually helped them in that space. Good example of how working with people, combining information, cloud and technology, you can actually do and innovate and do new things. Third one is a website that is called Quirky. This is a guy that invented back in 2005, 2006, one of the many uh, little uh, tools, little gadgets that you can buy with, uh, for your iPhone. And so he built the gadget, he ended up taking a patent, he got it manufactured, and so on and so on and so on. And he realized this was an extremely cumbersome process. So the guy basically said, look, every inventor needs to go through the same process. I'm not going to invent another tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an environment to go and to facilitate going through the process. So what has he done? He's built a website in which anybody, you, me, anybody, can give an ID. And the community votes on those IDs. And IDs bubble up. And every week, they take one ID, the one that's bubbled up the most, they work with the guy that brought the ID, and they're going to bring that ID to market and share the revenues. Very interesting. Okay. The, there is one of, the, one of the things there. You see that round stuff at the left? I don't know where it's, uh, it's very visible. It's a, um, you know, a thing, a power cord where you can mit, put multiple, okay. How many of us have had, you know, you have one of those uh, rectangular things and then you put one in but it overlaps half over the next one so you can't use the power outlet, okay? Hey, we all got that, okay? Well, what does the guy think about is just one that you can move so that you can move the power outlet out of the way. Very silly, very simple. The guy made a fortune out of that. The company also made a fortune out of it, by the way. But that's examples of how you can actually innovate new businesses, do new things using those technologies that we actually have. So let me conclude. The first thing I want to say is, and this is a question I often get, with cloud, is the CIO going to disappear? Because if I, get, if I source everything from the cloud, why the heck do I still need a CIO? Well, that's a very fair question. But at the same time, like I said right at the start, te that technology, that IT, is really z rippling all over the place in the company. So I believe that a smart CIO today should really become the CTO of the enterprise. The person that understands both the business and IT and can really guide the enterprise to how IT can improve, help improve the business, being it the business processes, being it uh, the product service combinations, being it the ecosystem collaboration, being it IT itself. And so from that, really become and change and, and become a very important element in the way the enterprise evolves. And why is that important? Why is it important that we go through that journey and that we really transform ourselves to act and take the reality that is in place um, to really move from that T to that I 
like I was actually talking about. You know, we're gonna continue living with our legacy environments, but we're gonna, our, gonna have our legacy environments combined with cloud environments. We're still gonna have discussions about budgets. That's not gonna change. And there's still gonna be concerns about compliance and security and others. But I think that despite all of that, we're on a journey and a journey of transformation in a digital world that is really giving us tremendous opportunities to do things differently. And if Nelly Cruz wants to have those two and a half million new jobs that she's actually talking about, I think it's out of that, out of that new innovation, out of those changes, out of doing those things differently that we really will find and will get them. This is a quote that came from Alvin Toffler, the, the little bit older ones amongst you may remember Alvin Toffler, the third wave. This goes back to 1985, but I think, still think 25 years later it's still perfectly applicable. He says the message is, of change is perfectly plain. Companies will ruthlessly review their base premises and be ready to jettison them, or they will become exhibits in the Museum of Corporate Dinosaurs. So let me finish off by saying, do you want to be an exhibit in a museum, or do you want to be out there kicking the ass and really get things moving? That's the opportunity that we have. That's how we can actually move forward. Thank you very much. Very thought-provoking and stimulating. Uh, so, uh, do anybody have any specific questions or, or comments um, uh, from Christian's uh, call to action there? Richard? So, no, no, no. <laughs> Absolute congratulations. Exceedingly strongly put. But then let me put a, a challenge back on this to the broader IT industry that flows from this by telling a very brief story. I heard a presentation at the CIO summit in London a week back from a company whose business is in waste sorting out. Mm -hmm. They are a high people, high asset intensive business with very low margins. They have done absolute miracles using all the capabilities you've talked about yep. to drive up their margins make themselves more successful, highly innovative, and they're innovative in just the way you talk about. And I put this question to the CIO. I said, you've got uh, about half a dozen different IT companies who you draw on for all these capabilities. Do they ever come to you and say, teach us from your experience what you're doing with our capabilities so that we can be even better suppliers? And he said, no way. All they do is to send another marketing person to sell me more. They do not come and learn from my experience and they've given me the tools to learn a lot. And that's one of the problems with the competitors. They will not go and learn from the users, despite the fact that everything you're talking about is user-driven innovation. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you say. Um, I can talk to you about what we do in that particular space, uh, but I don't, want to, I don't want to have the impression I'm doing here a marketing pitch because I'm not a marketeer at all. Um, but no, you have a fair point. Uh, I think we can still learn. I think we, we're trying to do as much as we can in there um, and, and trying to learn as much as we can from our customers. We do also a lot of combined innovation with customers. Uh, but it's a fair point you're saying. Uh, the, and particularly the, the, the drive and the push on uh, results, short-term results, like we just talked about, actually pushes people to sell rather than to listen. Um, we've put a number of chief technologists in place to actually help in that, uh, but you're right, it's a fair point. It's a very fair point. Next question. You talked about dinosaurs in yes. your presentation. You also talked about CIOs. And you talked about CIOs having to manage, uh, let me call it the existing dinosaur landscape, yes, as well as adopting the cloud, uh, which is a very difficult, uncomfortable position absolutely. to be in. It's a little bit schizophrenic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. So, so how do you, I mean, how do you advise them to manage that dichotomy? I, 
okay. Um, the the way the way we we've actually proposed them to do is to keep a small cell focused on the traditional environment. And typically, what we're what we're suggesting them is to use a number of the little bit older, very experienced people to really keep the traditional environment in place, <laughs> and to really take advantage of the combination of the experience of some of the more enthusiastic older people and the younger generation, that enthusiasm that comes out of that, that millennium generation to really go and reinvent the new space. And it's doing that careful balance with, with the eyes wide open so that you can really understand what is actually happening. That's what we suggest them to do, yes. And, and what about the land in between the new space and the old space? Is, is, I'm talking about an integration issue here, really. Is, is okay. that a big hurdle? It, so, so, the, the, so you grow your new space one step at a time. Uh, often the suggestion that we make to people is to say, look, you're going to get into something new. Don't put one of your mission critical applications in something or your mission critical things in something new first because you first need to gain the trust of that new technology. So start with something like potentially development testing or uh, smaller, less um, mission critical type applications first so that you really learn, that you, that you get yourself the confidence that you can really take it forward. In that process, reintegrate back the information that you need because and start considering your data sources that you have. Make an analysis of your data sources, where they are, what they contain, who's responsible of them, what their level of sensitivity is, and then see how you can tap back into them. And one of the very important elements in and around that is the, 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 the understanding, both for the applications and the data, of what is core and what is context. Uh, I don't know if any of you have, have, have heard Jeffrey Moore speaking about core versus context. So Jeffrey Moore says there's probably 20% of what a company does that is really making that company what it is. That's what he calls core. And the 80% other percent are basically things that you need to have. You need to have HR, you need to have a whole bunch of stuff, but they, don't, they really don't differentiate yourself. Okay. And so what we go is we, we, we apply that to the applications and the data of enterprises and say, hey, what is core to you that's probably something you want to keep under very, very close control. What is context? Probably less. It's less important. So if CRM is absolutely core to your way of doing business, does it make sense to bring CRM to salesforce.com? It's a very good question. If it's context, if it's something you need to have because you need to know which customers you contact and so on and so on, makes perfect sense. So that's the sort of question we actually get them to. And both on a data perspective as well as on a application perspective. And then making those decisions. That requires fundamental governance that is set between the business and IT. This is not a decision that IT takes in its own hands. This is a decision that the company needs to take as a whole. I, I don't know where I responded to your question, but I tried. No, that's, 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 that's fine. I think it's a question that has no uh, definitive answer at the moment. No, it doesn't. We're still working on it, aren't we? So, last chance to put a question or comment to, to Christian before we move uh, to the final session. Um, more comment or kind of clarification. On the one hand, you say, well, uh, there needs to be the shift in IT from the T the stress on the T and put the stress on the I. Yes. Uh, but on the other hand, you say, well, the CIO will disappear and will be replaced by the CTO. So what is right now, the I or the T? <laughs> or will both cohabit uh, in the future still? I, I think that if the, if the enterprise, when it, if you saw my slides, the T sort of became a little bit more faded, but it didn't disappear completely. Okay? And the objective is not for the T to disappear completely. The point is, what 
Oh, what I see a lot of business people in enterprises that are not IT companies, let's put that first, is there is no real good understanding of what technology can allow you to do. And I believe that it would be a real added value on the board in an environment where everything becomes more and more digital to have somebody that understands the I, but also understands the T, to really help all the other guys that understand the I but don't understand the T to actually what is feasible and what is not. That's why I'm saying that. Does that make sense? Right, well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to uh, say big thank you to Christian for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.